Well, hello, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much for staying on. We've got a, an interesting, very interesting, in fact, last session. Uh, just some uh, announcements. Uh, my name is George Griffin, and I've been asked to chair this because our friends in Tallis uh, trains have decided to have a pre-strike. They're having a strike on the 5th of December, but a pre-strike just to let people know what the strike really is. So, so people who are using Tallis have had to leave, and they, they send their apologies. Also, I'm sure most people here have got trains and planes, etc., to catch, so uh, I, I'm going to try and keep this on time. Um, we have two talks, and then a discussion, and then uh, I'm going to try and, and pick out some uh, important points uh, from, the, from the meeting. And we'll then use the meeting as an advert for uh, Alfred's uh, wonderful uh, next um, meeting in Paris at the end of January, where we're discussing health inequalities, which of course is very much in parallel with this, uh, this meeting, and we're looking forward to that. So, the first talk is on migrants and communicable disorders, uh, the experience in Belgium, by Professor Erika Vice, who is the head of the Department of General Medicine, Infectious Diseases and Tropical Medicine in Antwerp. Erika. Thank you, and um, good afternoon from my side. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's uh, quite an honor for me to be um, allowed in this sacred room, the sacred building of the academy. Um, so I'm a medical doctor uh, in the first place. Um, I teach at university. Uh, I've been connected for a long time with the Choctaw Institute in Antwerp. And uh, as I said, um, a general internal medicine and infectious disease specialist. And it's especially from that perspective I would like um, to give you a brief overview of our experiences with communicable diseases, as it is called, and migrants. Um, I'll touch briefly first upon what do we really mean, migrants, because as probably has been discussed already earlier today, well, that may, that may be a flag. Um, uh, which may stand for a lot of, of meanings. Um, I'll uh, give you a brief idea of the trajectory, of the typical trajectory of uh, an asylum seeker in Belgium, um, or rather an executive summary. Now we'll touch upon some um, uh, important uh, communicable diseases of public health important. Um, and of course we can't um, really discuss all this without touching on access to care. So, first of all, what do we really mean with migrants? I, um, me, me being a, also a scientist, I wanted to, to clarify and to, to um, define first before I, I started with this talk, preparing this talk, okay, but what are we talking about? Are we talking about migrants? And then you could refer to the UN definition stating this is a person who, ha who moves from one country to another <coughs> for a, a, a period of at least a year. Or, um, but nowadays um, the terminology migrants is being used as a compilation of a big heterogeneous group of um, asylum seekers, economical migrants, refugees, etc. Um, some other reports uh, point towards newly arrived migrants, um, uh, which should define this group of, of who have just arrived in a new country over the past five years. Then ECDC defines also irregular migrants, uh, those who have, let's say, uh, in brief issues with papers. In Belgium, we hear in the newspapers a lot of trans migrants, uh, people who do not really wish to stay here, but are basically mainly on their way to the UK, with or without, usually without Thales uh, strikes. Um, but, um, or do we mean, um, very specifically uh, refugees, uh, people who are really, uh, who apply, who, have, who are complying with specific um, rules of protection, and finally uh, asylum seekers, people who have really um, opened or entered a, a formal procedure. All this is not just uh, to be sophistic or um, uh, to be ling ling 
linguistically correct, but there are also very important uh, consequences to each of these groups. Uh, first of all, in the kind of, of pathologies we associate, uh, or we may see in some of these groups, as I will show you in a minute, but also in the access to healthcare. Um, when you're in a formal asylum procedure, especially in Belgium, then your rights um, and, and everything has been arranged in a very different way, whereas if you are an irregular migrant, whatever that may mean, or when you have migrated 10 years ago. And by the way, also something I questioned myself, when do you stop being a migrant and when do you start being? I mean, my, my, the Vliegen family, they migrated in the, in the 18th century from Germany to Belgium, so am I still a migrant or not? I wonder. Um, so, but wherever you come from, um, Whenever you come from any other country, uh, people come with a backpack, not only with, with um, stuff and material and memories, but they may also come with their medical backgrounds, um, including uh, uh, whatever is endemic in their countries, um, um, immunizations that were done or not done, etc. And during their trajectory, as we all know, uh, um, things can become very harsh, very tough, um, uh, also, and may bring, may or may not bring them also um, at risk to acquire uh, additional uh, medical conditions. And then in different stages upon arrival and during their early uh, settlements, um, things with health may happen. And then I'm not only referring to communicable diseases, uh, that may be if you are supposed to stay in, a, in very crowded and very unhygienic conditions, then certainly that may have an impact on your health. Um, but, and there has been talking already this morning about the entire mental uh, component of, of migrant health, which is absolutely underestimated and underserved, I believe. Um, so this is also to be placed certainly in that early uh, settlement, um, but also when people are allowed and are in the possibility to stay for a longer period um, in the country, in uh, other health issues, um, uh, um, which are much more of social nature and may influence uh, the further evolution or devolution of their health. And then finally, to make the circle go around, migrants, settled migrants, may also um, wish to go back to their family and visit and become what we call in the travel health VFRs, visiting friends and relatives. And because uh, we, we <coughs> cluster these people mentally, uh, these are VFRs because often this is a quite vulnerable group of travelers who is often not aware of, of specific health risks uh, such as malaria or not maybe taking uh, enough precautions for this. So this is an entire cycle and depending on where you are, uh, health risks also including infectious diseases, health risks may be different. So what happens when you arrive in Belgium? Well, this is an extremely simplified executive summary. Uh, which I found on the, on the um, otherwise very interesting website of the, um, the General Commissariat uh, for the Refugees and the Stateless. Um, and I really um, would like to invite you to go and visit it because it's been quite illustrative. But so basically the executive summary is like this, when you enter the country and you register yourself um, uh, at the, 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 the service for uh, um, uh, foreigners' affairs, um, you get registered, um, then FEDASIL, which is the federal um, uh, department uh, for the reception of, uh, of uh, um, <coughs> asylum seekers, they um, give assistance and they, um, and they receive you, um, and then follows a series of interviews, and this seems very easy and very short, but often this can be very lengthy and complicated and tough and so on. And finally, a decision falls, whether uh, uh, you are giving, receiving a green light and then going on to the refugee status, uh, or when you get a no, and that is often when things become much more complicated. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah. Uh, here, when you get the no, this is uh, so. When when this happens, when you get uh, your green light, well, that is when you enter the system. And as it has been mentioned just before the break, that alone is also a bit tricky because then you enter the regular healthcare system, which, as we know in Belgium, is also 
not really straightforward, has a lot of bureaucracy, etc. So, but at least you have some health care protection. But when you have a no, that is when you're supposed to leave the country, and that's where trouble even becomes worse because then uh, you become without uh, papers, or unless if you can um, go for specific procedures and so on. But this is really a risk, risky situation. How long does that take? Usually. Oh, um, that depends a bit on, on where you where we are. Um, this um, I'm, I'm not aware. Actually, I think it may be two years, so maybe longer. Um, um, so uh, there is always um, yeah services are, are chronically underserved, um, and so they are trying to speed up. Um, but so it's quite a lengthy process, and and sometimes we have. For instance, patients who are having a, a personal interview scheduled, um, and then because they are ill, uh, then they have to reschedule, and so it's an extremely stressful period for most of these people. The interview, doing the interview, then waiting, and sometimes people seem as if they are waiting forever on then a certain decision, which is then not always very clear. To them. So it's this is um, a, a source of stress and depression uh, on its own. Anyway. About how many people are we talking? Um, so you see here, these are the, the data as they are given by the, um, by the official services uh, with a peak in 2015 as uh, I believe uh, uh, all European countries um, has uh, perceived. But contrary to the, to the perception of the perception which is also being fed um, by certain political parties, there is no steep increase, there is no question of this. Uh, we, we have uh, uh, a steady, um, if not the slightly declining um, request. Um, and most um, people, large majority, is still coming from um, Central Asia, Afghanistan, and all the Middle East, Syria, Palestine, uh, to a lesser extent Iraq, Eritrea, um, and so on. So these are the, is the large majority um, um, of uh, actual asylum seekers. Um, so um, when you enter the system, when you demand for asylum, um, you um, may be given uh, one of these places to, to stay in, and then later on, when you are really granted uh, your green light, uh, people are uh, located in, in separate, separate places where they may also live more independently, etc. So I'm going over this very brief, just to set a bit the scene. But because when it comes to, to offering medical health, uh, upon arrival, uh, the federal services, federal civil, they um, start already doing a very first brief health screen um, uh, to, uh, to tackle and screen a bit um, uh, important uh, health topics uh, such as vaccination status, um, a prior medical history, um, and so this this helps them first of all to decide who needs catch up vaccinations, etc. Where are we with the vaccination status of the young children? But also to direct more easily um, uh, people who have already comorbidities into uh, care, because as long as you fall on under. Uh, let's say the um, auspicious of, of Fedazil, when you are in an asylum center, there are medical doctors, there are nurses, and they do refer to the regular healthcare system. There is also uh, funding for the, uh, for the um, um, medical services we offer. So that is usually going quite smooth as long as people are in the asylum centers. But once they are given either the yes or the no, that is when things become much more difficult. So. Um, this first screening, the meaning of this first screening is of course to see where are you in your health status uh, when you enter the country um, and also to catch uh, or to pick up uh, important, uh, possible important health topics that may have played a role or may have um, entered uh, your health system say uh, or your, your personal health system um, during your travel or uh, in the first settlements. So um, this is where um, the medical services of the asylum centers know uh, who requires additional um, uh, vaccination. Um, but in terms of um, screening and, and, and picking up uh, important infectious diseases, as you see, well, uh, this is not really to be 
very, very scared about. Yes, there is occasional cases of scabies. Yes, there is varicella. Um, so mainly these are diseases which are closely related to um, the trajectory, the recent trajectory that people have gone through in unhygienic circumstances, etc. But um, really no um, big tsunami of uh, horrible uh, epidemics. So this um, is strengthening a bit the, the, um, the impression that the newly arrived refugees in general are a healthy population, but by doing this dangerous trajectory, which they often need to do, this may bring additional unhealth to their uh, prior situation. Um, uh, have to nuance that a little bit, because obviously me working um, in tropical health as well, of course we do see the occasional um, tropical import diseases in refugees, but also in migrants, all, all types of migrants. Yes, of course we do see them, but these are cases, this, this is uh, occasional, um, this is not a, a tsunami of new diseases which is um, superimposed on our healthcare system. And I mean, we as tropical doctors, obviously we are happy that we can apply our knowledge and expertise then. And so I'm talking about um, very rare cases, but we need to recognize them, of course. Eh? Rare cases of laos borne reaction fever, um, Vivax malaria, um, occasional cases of, of strongloidus uh, hyperinfestation, uh, or just like this week, eh, an Afghan uh, woman who um, came with very extensive Leishmania lesions. So yes, these things exist, but these are much more reflecting um, the, the healthy conditions under which um, these recent migrants have lived and have passed themselves, rather than that they represent a burden for our uh, healthcare system, eh? because these are very, very small in numbers. But they require very particular knowledge about this geographical medicine, um, otherwise, uh, we are not doing a good medical job. Um, one of the, um, there's a couple of um, points of interest from the, 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 the corner of tropical medicine. And there's obviously a number of diseases uh, which people may carry along when they come back or when they migrate from an, a hyperendemic or an endemic country. And some of these parasitic diseases or schistosomiasis and strongyloides, and especially strongyloides is important because when people are allowed to stay in the country and when they grow older and maybe through events of life um, have other diseases, then this strongyloides may be giving you a lot of problems um, when it has not been picked up earlier because that can really go go wrong and, and, and cause very disseminated infections. So this is a, a separate point of attention, uh, one of the points of attention um, when you receive people coming back from an, uh, an endemic um, country. Other elements that um, may be important, uh, but this is really already thinking ahead in their later settlements, is to give good travel advice and, and very good uh, to try and generate as much as possible awareness on safe travel, safe traveling back to the country which is your home country but for which uh, where you, for which maybe you should be more aware of health risks uh, when going back including malaria. But now let's go back to the asylum center because uh, once the first initial health assessment has been done um, obviously, and there's a lot of attention being paid to preventive health care, um, and that's um, in, within preventive health care, vaccination is, is obviously a very, very important pillar. In Belgium, um, we, um, are, we have been happy and proud to have always very good vaccination coverages, and we really try to keep it like that, even in times of um, uh, vaccine, uh, what's it called, vaccine denial and, and, and other difficult uh, topics. So um, we really try not to waste a lot of occasions to offer vaccination uh, for all the young children, but also catch up vaccinations for adults who have no proof of, uh, of having been vaccinated. So uh, there are, since 2017, there's new vaccination rules 
um, for the people arriving at the dispatching uh, uh, being, um, with an emphasis on polio vaccination, but also um, measles, mumps, rubella, uh, and, and, and diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, um, and also in the refugee center, uh, there's a follow-up uh, of the boosters, uh, etc. So this is one important point. Another important point is um, TB screening, um, which is being offered uh, in the asylum centers uh, with um, uh, chest X-rays um, uh, for all the, uh, the not very young children and, uh, and, and the, um, the adolescents, adolescents and, and, and adults. For those who can't have a chest X-ray, <coughs> other screening methods, for instance, through uh, the intradermal tests um, are being offered. Um, there's also, um, people are being invited um, to have uh, further testing. Um, this, uh, this brochure comes from the website of the, um, the what we call the VRGT, the, the, the Regional um, Association of uh, TB Care and, and, and Lung Health, um, um, which is taking care basically of, of, of TB screen, but also a follow-up um, of uh, known TB patients and um, is collecting uh, data on um, incidence of, of TB but also treatment. Um, and so these people have, are doing really a great job in everything which, um, um, which brings uh, all aspects of TB together. And that brings us immediately to this stage where migrants, whatever kind of migrant you are, um, brings you a bit at risk. Yeah? There is, um, in early settlements, you're being invited uh, for this uh, screening because you come from an, uh, um, an endemic country. Um, but it's mainly the, the later stages of settlements, um, and especially difficult housing situations, um, uh, poverty, uh, um, other concurrent health problems which may not be taken care of enough, such as HIV or diabetes or uh, any other important health problem, uh, these may also influence very much um, whether you will develop uh, TB or not later on in life. So where are we with uh, TB? Um, so these are 2017 data, but um, I was very happy to receive yesterday uh, the brand new 2018 uh, data from out. Um, so yes, we are we we are seeing a declining trend of, of uh, TB incidence uh, in the country, and we are officially a low incidence country. But if we compare ourselves to our neighboring countries, we could still do better. So um, we would still see this much more go down. Uh, so there's some kind of stagnation. Um, so we would really like to be more ambitious and try to go down much better. Um, and within these nearly uh, a thousand uh, TB cases a year, who are these people? Well, um, our asylum seekers, um, to name the category, they are part of it, but they are certainly not a predominant part of it. There's many other uh, risk groups in our society. Um, so asylum seekers are about uh, made out of, I mean, 10%, um, um, people without a regular documentation, but that is of course also part of these people, are also migrants, um, are uh, another 8 or 9%. Um, contacts of TB patients, uh, people, uh, homeless people, um, but again, within these homeless, uh, there may be also people having migrated from other places. Um, uh, people with HIV, um, occasional people in the healthcare sector. So, and then there's a whole lot of other people of whom we do not always know the clear risk factor. Yeah, but so clearly, um, people who have uh, a non-Belgian background, uh, and that's another definition. So you see, there's a lot of groups and lots of fuzzy definitions. Um, are more vulnerable for for several reasons uh, uh, because. Um, they have migrated from a, a high incidence country, so they may have more risk to have acquired uh, latent TB. But for this latent TB to develop, there's a lot of other things uh, that may push you to that. Um, and these are uh, more living conditions, uh, 
uh, other uh, health issues, etc. Uh, but uh, so our migrant population is a vulnerable population to develop um, a TB. So this is also something we should um, take into account. It's also a big city issue. Uh, um, I'm working in, in the Antwerp area. Clearly, we see a lot of TB cases there. Um, the edge, but mainly Brussels, uh, sees TB, whereas in other places and in rural places there is much less TB. So um, that is yeah, um, uh, why if, for instance, a GP who has done practice somewhere uh, in, um, in an average uh, Flemish village uh, will see only very rarely TB, but if you work in an inner, inner city hospital, um, TB is something you still see very regularly. Um, a couple of years ago, there was a lot of, of um, concern that um, MDR and even XDR TB uh, would be on the increase. And of course, every case of MDR TB is already bringing along a lot of complicated things, uh, long, longer isolation in the hospital, um, acquisition of complicated medication, toxicity, etc. So we have clearly a recall bias for every MDR case, let alone XDR cases, etc. We know them by name even years after, and I'm sure you know them also by name, um, because we, for each of these cases you have to fight hard to pull them through that disease phase. But so um, um, it's, that's why it's very nice to see data, epidemiological data, um, surveillance data, and to see the truth by data uh, which are objective. And so you can see that there is clearly uh, a declining trend of which um, we are um, happy. And obviously yeah, we shall see what 2019 brings. Um, but how did we reach there as a, as a country? Well. Um, so I will show you in a minute. Belgium is a very complicated country in, in many aspects. So that's why um, we are rich in, uh, let's say, grassroots organizations and professional organizations. So we are a country of, um, yeah, um, in French we say also de bruit. Uh, so uh, problem, problem solvers. Uh, so we are, as I mentioned before the break, Usually we are not so afraid of uh, the rules. Uh, we are rather always looking, okay, these are the rules and how can we work now? Um, but that has also to do with often um, absent uh, rules from somewhere else. Uh, but that means also that traditionally we have a very strong tradition um, in finding pragmatic solutions. And one of these fantastic pragmatic Solutions is again uh, is the entire construct uh, uh, by this by the VRT, so the, the lung association, in how they follow up uh, patients, uh, bring medication home, um, provide they have a fund which is called Belta TV Net, um, a fund where um, drugs, uh, second and third line drugs can be um, uh, given for free, so that TB treatment for everybody in Belgium should be free, so that that should at least not a hurdle uh, for TB treatment, and every patient is followed up until and even beyond uh, the end of the treatment, so that we can be sure that um, um, things go well. Um, there is a very close collaboration between specialized TB nurses um, and the, uh, all the other caretakers, uh, so uh, also these people, we know them by name. Uh, and if there is a patient who uh, may be somewhere escaping out of your fingers, uh, you give them a call, have you seen him lately, etc. So this is the advantage of relatively small scale. Um, I mentioned the Belta TV net, which is a, a, a financial um, service which um, uh, gives the opportunity of acquiring uh, or, or, or fund, which funds all um, TB treatment, especially for those uh, who, who need to take second uh, line treatment. And since the installation of this fund, uh, also the treatment success, even for uh, MDR TB, um, has gone up. Um, as I said, Belgium is a complicated country, but I think that I made my message clear on that. Um, HIV is closely related to TB. There, um, also we see a declining trend, and that is um, we are very happy to see that. 
Um, over the last four, five, four years uh, or, or longer, we have seen a declining trend, um, not only in Belgians, but also in people with a non-Belgian background, um, especially in the uh, patients uh, um, with sub-Saharan African um, uh, origins. But we see new trends, and I'll come back to that in a minute. So HIV in Belgium um, breaks down in um, half of it um, um, uh, gay men, and men having sex with men, and the other half is, is heterosexual. Um, among these gay men, uh, uh, we see now an, um, a steep decline in the Belgian um, gay population, and that is thanks to the, the PrEP, uh, the, uh, the, the pre-exposition prophylaxis medication uh, they prophylactically take, but we see an increase in new populations like from Latin America, uh, and from Southeast Asia, and that is of concern. Um, um, whereas in the heterosexual group, uh, traditionally these were African women, um, and this is still a hard to reach population uh, at times. Uh, often there's a lot of other elements that play stigma, self stigma, uh, other, a lot of other social, financial problems. Um, but we are happy to see that also here incidences are um, declining. Um, who makes the diagnosis? Well, GPs play, play an important role, but especially some of these difficult to reach groups, often they do not go to the GP and they end up in the hospital. So we as specialists, uh, gynecologists, but internists, do have important roles also to continue to recognize HIV um, and um, link people to care. Linkage to care as such is quite successful in Belgium, if I may say so, but that's very important, uh, provided you have access uh, to treatment. Um, very briefly, uh, hepatitis B and C, we have much less data. Uh, we have only um, um, relatively limited research data. But the point and the most important point I want to make, all these things cannot, could not happen, these positive evolutions could not have happened if we could not link people as much as possible to care. And the care in Belgium, I mean, we can do a lot of things, but you need to be in the system. And if you're out of the system, that's where trouble starts. And so there is this kind of backup system, which is called uh, emergency medical care, um, where if you have, if you are absolutely not in the system, um, then and you have an urgent medical problem, and there that is already a, a, a difficult thing. Yeah? How urgent is urgent? Um, and there you you need a go an approval, um, and that takes weeks before you have that approval. And then you may have some kind of emergency fund which, uh, which supports your <laughs> medical care. But even that system, uh, um, it's slow and bureaucratic, but it worked in a way. But this is um, now under threat or has been under threat recently and because of budget cuttings. Uh, even though it represents uh, a relatively small part of, of the entire budget, but this comes also in the entire framing, uh, um, it's, I mean, it's framing and then that is um, links to stigmatizing, scapegoating and so on. Uh, um, just to finish, uh, 3rd of May, this was in the news uh, and we all got very irritated about that, um, uh, saying, uh, yes, uh, there's now outbreaks of malaria, scabies and TB uh, in the North Station um, and so the buses will not stop there anymore because this is a, a threat for their health and um, everybody asked me, my, my, my friends, my relatives, huh? Uh, do, what's going on? I said, I have no idea. And um, so luckily, uh, soon after, um, a lot of people um, from the working in the field said, but please, there's, I mean, it, um, there is no outbreaks whatsoever um, in the North Station. Obviously, you don't need to be a PhD in infectious diseases to see that these are unhealthy living situations. But this is not the same. I mean, there was no outbreak, um, full stop. But the one, and there was only one outbreak, and that was an outbreak of fever, um, of electric, electric fever. But this is very, this is dangerous because the okay, message is. Uh, yeah, move on. I will move on. I will conclude. Good. This is dangerous because the message is out, and when the message is out, you cannot control it anymore. And even when all um, 
people from the field and professors come and say, no, no, this is different, etc., etc. We do not reach that population anymore, and so the rest is history. So to conclude, our newly arriving migrants are probably fairly healthy, but we may, by, by all the stages they go through, we know uh, um, they may become more unhealthy. Um, we have, um, when you're in the system, you have relatively good um, um, medical care, but uh, sometimes we have a hard job keeping people in the system, so access to care it remains a point of attention. And um, from an academic point of view, I think it's very important to keep bringing out the data as they are um, declining TB figures, declining HIV figures. I think this is important to keep also the same. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.